The race to make more ventilators. Robots on the front line. And how to look sharp on a digital date. This week, the UK went into lockdown over the continuing coronavirus crisis. We were told to limit all of our activities and stay at home. This comes as the World Health Organization says the pandemic is accelerating across the globe. Hospitals everywhere are facing a shortage of equipment, including ventilators. This life-saving equipment helps patients to breathe in the most critical cases when their lung function fails. The UK currently has around 8,000 ventilators in the country, but needs many more. So how do we urgently get access to more of these machines? Can we manufacture more of them in this country? Jen Copestake has been looking at some of the possible solutions. The UK government has put a call out to big businesses to help manufacture new ventilators. Already Dyson have answered, saying they are hoping to start production on 10,000 machines by mid-April. But will this be enough, soon enough? Teams of engineers and doctors are also trying to come up with more immediate solutions to this problem, which could be cheaper and more portable. We spoke to some of them this week. Most are committed to making their designs open source and freely available once they've been tested. These machines need to work 24 hours a day for up to 14 days at a time per patient. So set to respirate 15. A team from the University of Oxford and King's College London have quickly designed what they think is a workable ventilator, which could go into production right away, called Oxvent. It was presented to the UK Cabinet this week and was made to special COVID-19 regulations that the government published. And is driven into this box. Inside the box is a standard ambulance bag. These bags are normally compressed by hands to provide air to a, to a patient, but in this case we compress it using the pressure from our air supply. The device is made from 40 components, 90% of which are off the shelf, meaning they are already in the NHS supply chain and theoretically easy to procure. Oxvent will now be tested in Birmingham and may cost less than £1,000 per machine, compared to tens of thousands of pounds for ones in use in hospitals now. We want something that's simple and that can be built. And sure, I can make a ventilator as fancy as you like, but it's good. I'll get it to you in October if that's all right. That's not an option. In France, a collective have created what they call the Minimal Universal Respirator. They're confident it could enter the mass production phase in the coming days. They've already shown it to a Paris hospital. It's made of 3D printed components and hasn't yet been medically certified, but they say there is a need to innovate quickly in a crisis. When you need to, to do tracheotomy, when you don't have the kit to do it, you use that, a pen, okay? Uh, and we, we are doing something that is almost similar to that. It's okay, it's not a full feature respirator, but it may help save people. So we must try it. This attitude to try and iterate quickly is echoed in Spain, which has faced a rising death toll. This ventilator is also made from 3D printable parts. A group working out of the Leitat Technology Center only started the design a week ago. They've already brought it to a hospital to try out. It is going through the final stages of medical testing and if successful, will be ready to manufacture. It costs less than 500 euros to make and can be made in 24 hours. The group say they've been approached by manufacturers ready to produce between 50 to 100 a day once they receive approval. In Lithuania, people are working on a simple 3D printable respiratory device that doesn't need electricity. The idea was inspired by designs from Japan that have been tested on the International Space Station. If the prototype succeeds, they want to make it freely available to those most in need. When we think about third world countries, uh, where like uh, there is like extremely huge populations and they're not that developed in the medical uh, field, people would die uh, due to lack of equipment. 
We also saw a sophisticated solution which could be made quickly. In Canada, Thornhill Medical, whose battery-powered ventilators are used by the U.S. military, have been asked by the government there to ramp up production. Their portable intensive care device is battery-powered and generates its own oxygen from the air. They are already CE-marked and FDA-approved, and the designer believes they have the expertise to make them quickly in adapted automotive or aerospace factories around the world. If everybody puts the pedal to the metal and, and uh, goes full speed, I think this could be ramped up in very large numbers uh, pretty quickly. It's certainly inspiring to see how engineers around the world are coming together to work on this problem in the face of many challenges. But getting out cheaper, faster solutions could be critical for people everywhere where ventilators are scarce. That was Jen, and let's hope that technology really can be used as a force for good in this crisis and those machines get to the people who need them. Now, with about a third of the global population currently under some kind of lockdown, we are increasingly turning to tech to stay connected. And Chris Fox has been looking at some ways to recreate that social feeling at a distance. Like millions of us across the world, I've spent the last week self-isolating and staying at home. Luckily, I've been social distancing for about 20 years, so I've learned a thing or two about staying social without leaving the house. Hi. Hi, Zoe. How's it Video going? calls are suddenly all the rage, and this week, Instagram added a new feature called co-watching that lets you show off your favourite photos during an Instagram video call. <laughs> For a video chat with a difference, check out House Party. It's been lingering at the top of the app charts all week. Instead of calling your friends, you notify them when you're free for a chat, and up to eight friends can drop in to the same party. It's owned by Fortnite maker Epic Games, so of course you can play games here too. If you miss playing board games with your friends, Board Game Arena lets you choose from a range of modern games and some classics like chess and backgammon to play either against your friends or against internet strangers if you prefer. Most of the games are free to play, although the website is so busy at the moment it says it's giving priority access to premium subscribers at peak times. Here's a tip if you prefer to play your own board games, some of the video calling apps including Zoom and Skype will let you start a call on your phone but invite your computer as a guest participant using just one account. So you can video chat over here and use your phone as a camera to stream the game board. Now, this is the only game I've got in the flat to demonstrate with. It's a secret admirer board game where players have to work out who fancies them and call them on this phone. Is it Matt? Hi, sorry. Me. <laughs> oh, it's not Matt. <laughs> it's not Matt. Oh, no. Oh, bad luck, Spencer. Now, being in isolation doesn't necessarily have to put your dating life on hold. I'm trying a new app called Filter Off. It was originally designed as a way to beat catfishers' fake profiles because instead of just swiping yes and no on people to try and find matches with people you think are hot, instead you're matched with a set number of people to do speed date video calls on an evening. So what you do is you tell the app when you're free, well, I'm not doing anything else tonight, and then you're matched with people. And my first chat will be with Zach, founder of the app. And I don't even get to see his picture, just a few facts as sort of conversation starters. And it's counting down now. Your date begins in a few seconds. This is actually very tense. <laughs> hey, Chris. Hey, Zach, how's it going? <laughs> Good, man. How are you? Looking good. I've actually brought you to one of my favorite dining spots. It's my kitchen. Well, thank you for that. So why did you want to create Filter Off? Yeah, so I created Filter Off to give people an easy way to see if they vibe with one another. And I think the best way of doing that is through video. Couldn't this potentially be more brutal that you've actually spoken to someone and then they don't match with you? I mean, that's, that's the risk, right? But you could also show up on a date and then you never get texted. You can't use the excuse that you're busy because I know you're in isolation. <laughs> if your online date goes well and you get as far as Netflix and chill, 
then check out Netflix Party. It's a web browser plugin that synchronizes programs with your friends, so you're all watching the same part at the same time. It's free and it even adds a chat window so you can share messages without missing the action. We often think of virtual reality as a solitary experience, but there are a growing number of multiplayer games to try online, like this zombie shooter, Arizona Sunshine. The strangest thing for me is how you really do feel like your friend is in the room with you. It's a totally different experience from a video call. <laughs> and if fighting off zombie hordes is a bit too close to the bone right now, try Rec Room, which is cross-platform and free. The game lets you hang out with friends, play games together, and even interact with strangers in a way that somehow gives you a feeling of being connected to the world. Perhaps when we come out of isolation in a few weeks' time, we'll have made some new friends along the way. Yay! Hello and welcome to the week in tech. It was the week a new daily COVID-19 symptom tracker was launched by King's College London and health startup Zoe to let anyone share their data with researchers and the NHS. Phone sales dropped by the industry's biggest ever amount since the invention of the smartphone due to upheaval of manufacture and supply. And kids gaming giant Minecraft is offering its educational lessons to children for free during the pandemic, complete with tours of the International Space Station. In more good news for parents, streaming service Disney Plus launched across most of Europe, albeit with reduced picture quality. The platform follows Netflix, YouTube, Facebook and others with a 25% lower bandwidth as internet traffic spikes. People should avoid using their microwave at the same time as their Wi-Fi. That's the advice from media regulator Ofcom, who this week gave out tips on how to improve your internet speeds. Other tips included enabling Wi-Fi calling on your smartphone and downloading films in advance to reduce reliance on streaming. And finally, an Oscar-winning composer has come up with a new musical composition, but she's not the one performing it. Hildner Gudnater's latest piece has been performed by a robotic musician as part of an art exhibition in Zurich. The robot arm was programmed by Swiss firm Gemelli Engineering. Roll over, Beethoven. Our lives have changed dramatically with novel problems needing novel solutions. Across the globe, healthcare systems are flat out. The coronavirus is proving an unprecedented challenge for us humans. But we are starting to see how robots could help us out. Hey Temi, what's the weather in London today? Here is the weather in London, United Kingdom today. We met Temi a couple of years back. In more normal times, we talked about the weather and had a cup of tea. But now Temi is on the front line of this crisis. Thousands of the devices have been interacting with contagious hospital patients in China, Hong Kong, Japan and Korea, as well as some care homes in the US. The bots autonomously move between patients, providing remote video chat with doctors and nurses, even taking their temperature from up to 60 centimetres away. The AI-embedded voice-activated device can run Amazon Alexa as well as other voice platforms such as Tencent in China. Today's chips are so advanced in power that enable us to do a lot of very, very complex calculations in order to bring data from multiple sensors in real time so the robot can understand how the environment looks like how the user looks like. And specifically for the corona situation, this is what you need. Naturally, there are regulatory and practical issues as to how easy it would be to implement this kind of tech around the world. And of course, a robot is never going to replace human interaction. But right now, we need all the help we can get. Help is also at hand from this robotic arm, designed by researchers at China's Tsinghua University. The wheeled device treats patients on behalf of medical staff too. 
It can be controlled remotely from anywhere in the world, performing typically close contact tasks, such as ultrasounds and mouth swabs, as well as listening into organs without the need for a stethoscope. Robots don't have to be high-tech to be handy, though. School students in Taiwan have used Lego to build automated disinfectant spray bots. Ultrasonic sensors detect any approaching hands and start a motor that presses the trigger of a plastic sanitizing spray bottle. The idea doubling up as a reminder of the importance of regular hand washing during the pandemic. Some of these ideas are clearly more impactful than others, but it is a united global approach to deal with what is a global problem. That was Lara, and robots aren't the only machines that have been enlisted into the fight against COVID-19. The battle against the coronavirus has also gone airborne, as Danny Vincent reports from Hong Kong. Governments around the world have been experimenting on how to incorporate drones to mitigate against the coronavirus. During the outbreak in China, the government deployed drones to warn people off of the streets, sometimes by following them all the way home. Chinese companies are the world leaders in drone technology, but their use in this pandemic has gone worldwide. It's also raised questions about privacy and state surveillance. Here in Hong Kong, the government encourages us to work from home. I conducted these interviews remotely over the internet. I've also self-isolated during these turbulent times. In South Korea, the local government has been working with the drone company DJI to disinfect the streets of Sungnam, a city half an hour outside of the capital. South Korea has been praised for its response to COVID-19. They've adapted drones used for agriculture to spray disinfectant from the sky. They call this drone quarantine. Drones can be effective and precise in areas where humans can't easily reach because they can spray disinfectant from a height where humans are not able to reach. Drones are also more suitable for disinfecting things like trees. And because it can spray from two to four liters a minute, it's very effective. These drones were developed originally for the use in agriculture. They have multiple nozzles that sit underneath motors controlled by wireless powered handsets. Its FPV camera allows it to transmit data back to the pilot. Here in Sungnam, they say they can disinfect an area 10 times faster with drones than with people. With the progress being made with artificial intelligence, DJI believes it's just a matter of time before we see automated drones helping with everyday life. But it's not just DJI using drones to disinfect. At the height of the outbreak in mainland China, other drone companies like XAG employ drones to disinfect urban areas. XAG's R80 agriculture robot has also been deployed on the ground. It can spray disinfectant at 360 degrees and is controlled by a wireless transmitter. In South Korea, the city plans to wider deploy drone quarantine. This may be social distancing 2.0. That was Danny Vincent, and we'll be checking in with Danny for regular stories from Asia over the coming months. Now, when this is all over, it's hard not to think that some things just won't go back to the way they were. And one of those things might be business conferences. Last week, it was supposed to be Taiwan-based HTC's massive shindig with people flying in from all over the world. But when this couldn't happen, they went ahead with it anyway in virtual reality. Stephen Beckett was invited, and this is how it went. Virtual reality headsets have had a rough ride over the last few years, with, it's fair to say, plenty of excitement and a definite dollop of disappointment. But maybe now is the time to give VR another chance. Can it help us meaningfully connect, 
or is it just a glorified video call? So like a lot of people right now, I am stuck at home, but that doesn't mean I can't go somewhere. And it also doesn't mean I can get out of doing my job. Certainly not with one of these around. Hey, this is great. Nice to meet you, nice to meet you. Should we shake hands? We're allowed to shake hands in VR. Yeah, shake, shake hands. There you go. Yes. We, we can't do it in real life, but we can do it in, uh, in the virtual world. Many organizations have been looking again at VR as a host of global conferences have been canceled due to COVID-19. I'm standing inside a preview of Engage, a VR experience due so far for education, but now it's being souped up to host a conference for hundreds of people. HTC is one of the main VR headset manufacturers. In fact, they made the one I'm wearing right now. If there's any company that should be able to take their conference virtual, it's them. So, so where are we? We, we are, this is the, the main venue for the presentation of the Virtual Vive Ecosystem Conference. So we, we have a conference every year, you know, because of the coronavirus, we have to do it differently this year, which is why we worked with Engage to create a virtual venue and everybody from anywhere in the world who wants to come can join. Some people will look at this and they'll say, you know, this is a kind of glorified video call, glorified Skype call. Um, what, what do you say to that? So when you're doing video conferences and um, you feel very safe and you're just looking at a screen. Now I'm going to do something really weird. I'm going to get right up close to you. Okay. Now, can you do this on video? <laughs> Does that feel awkward? It's a little bit intimidating. Yes, exactly. So the thing, the thing with video, it is fantastic. And yes, you can, can communicate, but inside virtual reality, you feel like you're in the room with the person. And that's something you can't do on any other platform. Beyond more natural human connection, being in VR means you can do and see things you might never do in the real world. Now, if you pull your trigger on the chicken, you can move him. Oh yeah. That's not every conference you get to hold a chicken, is it? Oh, we're actually in the hippo, Stephen. We'll have to move back. Oh, I'm inside the hippo. Uh, a lot of people would say that VR hasn't really taken off in the way that people were hoping it would. What, what's your take on that? The hassle of using the device and the change in people's habits is right now outweighing the benefits for the average person. This is where it changes from now going forward. The catch with a virtual conference is that it can happen in any time zone, and this one is happening in the middle of the night for me. So after a quick round of basketball, oh, nearly. play on the xylophone and a group hug, I'm off to get some sleep. Okay, so it's 2 a.m., I'm up, I'm awake, it's well past my bedtime, but it's also the perfect time for a uh, conference on the other side of the world. So I'm just going to get a few VR things set up and then we're going to try and see if we can join just in time for the opening speech. Let's see if it works. Oh, it better work. Oh look, wow, here we all are. Ah, oh, look, Alvin's here. Right, right now it's not about the okay. country, it's not about it's starting. Oh, should I sit down? Causing a problem, everyone's looking at me. We also need to go back. And of course, you can't applaud in a video call like you can in the virtual world. Oh, you can see the start of a really, really good idea there. I can, I can imagine what that would be like if the headsets were, were a bit lighter and a bit easier to use and the computers were a bit stronger and the graphics were a bit better. Give it a few years and I can imagine that this is something that people might want to do. Even so, is it enough to stand between me and my bed? Not quite. Maybe in a few years. Next week, unbelievably, in the middle of all of what's going on, it is Click's 20th birthday. I know. And so we're going to bring you something that hopefully will take your mind off things for a little bit. A blast back to the past and a look at our greatest hits since the year 2000. I wish you well, be safe, and we'll see you next week.